Hey, good morning. It is about that time, so I'd encourage you to make your way toward a seat somewhere. We're certainly glad that, that uh, you're with us this morning. Uh, uh, beautiful Lord's Day that we have, and so thankful that uh, you've made way out uh, today. We know that several are, are, are sick uh, and not with us, so we want to continue to remember them. And, and we also know that several of you may not be feeling the best or maybe overcoming your own uh, struggles, and so we're thankful that you've made a decision uh, to be here with us uh, this morning as well. Um, I actually don't see uh, any visitors, uh, so we'll forego the, the normal comments about our, our uh, uh, what do we call it, connection cards, yes, thank you, sorry. Uh, so this morning we'll get started with, um, I think Davin is going to uh, uh, do our scripture reading and then Gunner uh, will lead us in our youth song. And then uh, Brother Jason Grow will uh, will will take off and, and go from there with our regular song leading. So, uh, if you would go ahead and silence your phone, as Bob always reminds us, uh, and let's turn our hearts and our minds toward uh, worship of our Lord and Savior. Good morning. Today, I will be reading 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love and does not know God, because God is love, and this love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son from, into the world so that we, may, we might live through him. And this is love, that, yeah, that not we have love. God, but, but that he loved us and sent him to, and he sent his son to, to be the prop, propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If love one another, God abides in us and love is perfect, perfected in us. We will be singing thy word. Thy word. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I, I think I've lost my way, still you are to beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please. Be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will not forget your love for me yet. I will love you to the end. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Good morning. Our first song this morning will be number 660. 660. There is a habitation. <clears throat> there is a habitation built by the living God for all of every nation who seek that grand abode. Oh, Zion, Zion, 
I long thy gates to see. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? A city with foundations firm as the eternal throne, nor wars nor desolations shall ever move a stone. O Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? No night is there, no sorrow, no death and no decay. No yesterday, no morrow, but one eternal day. O Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? Within its pearly portals, angelic armies sing with glorified immortals the praises of its King. O Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? Next song this morning will be number 231. <clears throat> Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land, way down in Egypt, mid burning sand. Moses had started for Canaan's land, never turned backward, always a sin, unto the journey's end. Hilltops of glory. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Footsteps of Jesus before us lead. We tread life's journey, his warning seed. Evil allurements cannot prevail. I'm on the upward trail. Hilltops of glory. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Will you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, we come this day before your throne, giving thanks always. You've given us yet another Lord's day to come and assemble, Father, to sing songs of praise to you, Father. Let us hearken to those words of each and every one. Let us learn from them. 
apply them to our lives, Father, and seek to live out the words that we sing. Likewise, Father, as we come and study your word, let us open our hearts and our minds, Father, our hearts deeply, looking to your word. It was read this morning that people will know that we are your children because we love each other. That love is the defining characteristic as being a Christian. Father, we give so very much our thoughts and our prayers for those that are absent. Father, those that are coming, that are sick and ill, and yet strive to be here in your presence. We ask that you bless each and every individual here, Father, this day. The families, the children, Father, as we saw earlier, all that they strive and do in their classes, seeking you. So as always, we pray that each and every individual that comes into our assembly, that we seek your wisdom, Father, that we seek to do and live according to your word. And as your children, we should know that we should be more like you because you are our father, not because we are your children. You set the standard, Father. You are holy, we should be holy. And as such, we know that we sin, Father. We pray and beg for your forgiveness, for your never-ending, long-suffering mercy that you have given to us. We are so very thankful. Father, we repent of those things that we do that is against you. We know we sin against you. Be with us, Father. Let us come together as one. We pray for those, again, here. We pray for our leaders, Father. We, we pray that they seek your wisdom and your word. Bless them in all that they do. Bless the world leaders, Father, and let them strive to seek peace. We know ultimately the only peace is knowing you, knowing your son, and that will be found to us in our heavenly home. Be with us the remaining of this hour, Father, as we come and again worship you. We ask these things in your son's blessed and holy name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let's stand as we uh, sing our next song before Lee's lessons. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Please be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Hope and pray as we've been worshiping God and as we continue to, that the peace of Christ is with you this morning. Uh, as many of you know, for about the past year and a half, I have been writing my dissertation at Asbury Seminary. Uh, this is a picture of some studying going on with uh, our, our cats present as well. Um, but a dissertation is basically a very, very long paper. Uh, it's really more like a book th than a paper. Uh, and one question that almost anyone who's writing a dissertation fears being asked is, what are you writing your dissertation about? Uh, that's 
That's such an easy question, obvious question to ask, but it's not easy to answer. Uh, once, when I was earlier on in my studies, not writing my dissertation yet, I was sitting at lunch with a student who was writing his at the time, and I just asked him what his dissertation was about, just expecting a two to three sentence summary, and he ended up telling me about his dissertation for like the next 20 to 30 minutes. And I was just trapped there having to listen. Uh, and and it, it was kind of interesting because I like those kinds of things, but it was just way more than I was expecting uh, when I asked that question. It's very hard to summarize uh, a project like a dissertation. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts that go into writing it. And also when you're just neck deep in the process and it's filling up so much of your time, it's on your mind so much and it all matters so much to you, uh, it makes it hard to summarize it in just a few sentences. But imagine with me if someone asked you to summarize God in one sentence. That's all you have. You've got one sentence. How are you going to describe him? That's not easy. Now, some of you might be thinking at first, oh, that doesn't actually sound so hard. I'm sure I could say something. But when we really think about it, it's not easy because there's so much to say about God. Do we use that one sentence to talk about him as the creator of heaven, and, of heaven and earth? Or do we talk about him instead as a just and moral judge over humanity? Or do we talk about how he is inv involved in the affairs of this world and in, in the affairs of our lives? That might be important to qualify because some people think God is very distant and very uninvolved. Uh, or do we make sure to make it clear that he is the God of Christianity and not some other God? There's a lot that we could choose, but again, in this scenario, you've only got one sentence to work with. Well, let's make it even harder. Let's say you've got one word to describe God. One word. What's it going to be? Maybe we'd say all-powerful, although I guess that's really two words. Uh, or maybe we want to say that he is uh, the lawgiver. That's at least one word. It's a compound word, but it's one. Maybe we'd say creator. Or maybe we just refuse to play by those rules and say that God is just so much bigger than any one word, and so this whole attempt to summarize him in one word is really kind of silly. And uh, all of those statements, including that last one, actually, would be true. God is all-powerful. He's the lawgiver. He's the creator. And there's also way too much to him to describe him in one word. Uh, there aren't enough words in the English language to capture who he is uh, because there are still so many mysteries to God that we will never understand, at least on this side of eternity. Uh, and we may not understand it entirely on the other side of eternity either. It just depends on how much God chooses uh, to reveal to us. But in our passage for 1 John this morning, John chooses one word. He said a lot of words so far, and he will go on to say more after this. But here in this passage, he chooses one. And he says what he says in such a way uh, that it's clear that this one word captures the essence of who God is. It captures his character. And that one word is love. We come this morning upon probably the most famous passage in all of 1 John. And one of the most powerful statements about love and about God in the entire Bible. And that's 1 John chapter 4. This passage gets a bit eclipsed uh, often by another powerful statement about love in the Bible, and that's the Apostle Paul's words in 1 Corinthians uh, 13. We tend to love that chapter because uh, in that chapter, Paul talks so much about the importance of love and how uh, without it, uh, all that we have, uh, all that we do is worthless. All that we have is nothing without love. Uh, and he talks so much about what love looks like, how love is patient. Love is kind. Uh, love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude and so on. And he even says love never fails. 1 John chapter 4 tends to get overshadowed by 1 Corinthians 13. But it contributes something that 1 Corinthians 13 does not. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us a lot about what love looks like. But John tells us where love comes from. And by telling us that, he tells us how we can actually become people who look like and who embody 1 Corinthians 13. John tells us the source of love and, and what makes it possible for us to receive it and share it with others. A couple of months ago, when we started reading this book together during worship, uh, I mentioned to us that 1 John is circular rather than linear. And what I meant by that is that instead of following and developing one train of thought from the beginning of the book all the way uh, to the end, 
Uh, instead of that, John has a few truths that he keeps packaging and repackaging in different words uh, over and over again so that we come upon these teachings uh, multiple times. Uh, reading First John is kind of like getting in the ocean and just riding wave after wave, uh, but each wave is the same truth just washing over us uh, again. And so now that we're in First John chapter 4, we're going to read some things that probably sound familiar because John has been saying them in one way or another for the past three chapters. Uh, we've read a lot already about God's love for us and the love that we're called to have for God and the love that we're called to have for our brothers and sisters in Christ. John has more to say about all of that this morning in what is probably the most profound passage of the book. And what he says is meant to direct our attention to the one who made heaven and earth and who reigns over all things and who knows even the number of hairs on our heads. And John wants to direct our attention to the very core of who he is, to his very heart, to the very center of his being, so that we can become like him. Our passage is too long and says too much for us to cover every word of it this morning. I'm really only going to direct our attention to a couple of the main pieces of what John says. And so I think it'd be appropriate to begin by simply reading this beautiful passage of scripture. And again, let me, let me say, John is more circular rather than linear in the way he writes. And so if some of what he says as we read this together seems to take some twists and turns and is a little difficult to follow, uh, don't worry about it. Just let the words wash over you right now as, as we read. John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. There's a lot here. Uh, almost every sentence we could meditate on for a whole day. But central to everything John says is the statement he twice makes in this passage, God is love. This is possibly the most important statement about God in scripture. It's not a new statement. Uh, John is not telling us something we do not already know when, when uh, he tells us this. But he is capturing, he is summarizing in one word what this God is like who created heavens and earth and who fills the pages of this book, who fills the pages of scripture, and who wants to fill your life. That God is love. I think it's very significant that John does not say God is loving. He says God is love. If John had said God is loving, then love would be something that is true about God, uh, but love would be kind of this separate entity out there that God just happens to have some of in his heart, like you or me or our friends are loving. All of us can be loving, but that love may not last forever, uh, and it may be overruled by other things in our hearts. Love might take a back seat when we're really angry or when we're really scared or really offended, uh, it shouldn't. We all know as followers of Christ it shouldn't, but we also know sometimes it does. But John doesn't say that God is loving. John says that God is love. From start to finish, 
this is what characterizes God. It informs every action, it determines every word, and it guides every thought. Love is at the center of who God is. It radiates out from him, and no one who draws near to him can be unaffected by it. By saying God is love, John tells us something very important, not only about God, but about love. Uh, I mentioned near the beginning of this year, as we started this whole theme back in February, I mentioned that the world has a lot of ideas about love, and so many of them are wrong. And if we want to sift through all those ideas about love and see what it really is and, and what it really looks like and where its life-changing power really lies, we need to look to God. He is the one who determines what love really means because love comes from him. If we want to know what love looks like, we need to look to God. And John says that here. But John doesn't just say that. John doesn't just leave us there. Uh, God does a lot. I think we all know God does a lot throughout all the pages of Scripture. And some of his actions are very obviously motivated by love. But other, other actions of his kind of perplex us. And at first glance, at first reading, we might not necessarily see how they're motivated by love. I'm not saying that they're not, but sometimes it's just hard for us to understand. But John doesn't leave things that open-ended. He points to the central action of God and says, this is how we see love. Right after saying God is love, John says, in this the love of God was made manifest among us. It was made known, made visible among us, that God sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. And then in the next verse, he goes a step further and says, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I know propitiation isn't a word that we just use every day, uh, but the basic idea is the idea of an atoning sacrifice. God sent his son to atone for our sins, and in this, John says, is love. And we know how he atoned for them. He atoned for them by laying down his life, a pure, innocent, holy life, and allowing it to be taken by the very people he created in his image. He atoned for sins by laying down his life on the cross so that all the evil, all the sin of this world for all time, including yours and mine, all of it could be atoned for and forgiven. Again, John does not say God is loving. If he did, if he did say that, then the cross would just be one loving moment from God in the past, and that's all. But his next, his next actions may or may not be loving. Uh, he may have loved you enough to die for you, but perhaps not enough to live with you in relationship. And he may decide that if we're going to keep on sinning, even after knowing what he's done for us on the cross, well, then that love is over. His love is just not going to extend that far. But John doesn't say that because he doesn't say God is loving. He says God is love. This kind of sacrificial love is at the center of who he is. This kind of love, the love that went on the cross radiates out from his very heart. It is stable and dependable because God does not change. This is the kind of love, the love that went to the cross. This is the kind of love that informs every action, determines every word, and it guides every thought. The cross was not just a brief moment of love from God. It captures who he is from all eternity and who he always will be. If he had to, he would make that sacrifice again, and he would make it again, and he would make it again, and he would make it again. Because the love that the father had in giving up his son, and the love that the son had in laying down his life, is always in his heart. It is always here, and it is always directed towards you. There's an eternal place of peace and safety, strength and confidence, and it's found in God because God is love. It's there when life is going wonderfully and it's just abounding with blessings. It's there when tragedy strikes. It's there in times of great fear and uncertainty. It's there regardless of what may be going on in our human relationships. It'll be there regardless of who wins this election in a couple of weeks. It's there when we sin and when we turn away from God. And when we're like the prodigal son and come to our senses and come back to our father in repentance, it's there to receive us back 
with open and eager arms. God is love from all eternity to all eternity. This wonderful passage begins by saying that whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And then a little bit further down, we read in verse 16, whoever loves abides in God and God abides in him. And then in between those two verses, we read verse 13, uh, where we read, by this we know we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. John has already talked about uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit in 1 John. He talked about that in chapter 3, and so we've already talked about it as well. But there's something I want us to notice about John placing the Spirit here in this passage. God is love, and he has given us of his Spirit, which means the Spirit he's given us is a Spirit of love, since it's the Spirit of God. It really can't be any other way. If the Spirit of love is within us, how can that not shape us into people who love like God does? This is a goal God has in giving us his spirit. He doesn't give it to us at random. He doesn't give it to us for no purpose. He gives us his spirit so that the love that is at the center of his being can be at the center of ours. And from there can grow and work outward to fill the entire person and to change a person's entire life. When John says God is love, he's not just telling us about God. He's telling us about who we are supposed to be. And this is why he begins the passage saying, Beloved, let us love one another. And this is why he also ends the passage by saying, Whoever loves God must also love his brother. We are called to have God's love in our hearts. And it is by God's spirit, it is by our submission to that spirit, that his love is going to grow there. This is the great task of the Christian life. This is what you and I are created for. This is what it's all about, being shaped into the image of God, being shaped to look like the one who is love. This is a process that John calls here being made perfect in love. Let me read this portion of our passage again. This is verses 17 through 19. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence uh, for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. When someone becomes a Christian, they embark on this great task that John describes here. They embark on this great task of being made perfect in love. We are called to be made perfect in loving one another, as John says here. Uh, From the rest of Scripture, it's clear that we're called to to be made perfect in loving all people. And from verse 18, we are called to be made perfect in our love for God. At the beginning of the Christian life, we may serve God not only from love, but also from fear. We don't want to get in trouble. We don't, want to, we don't want to be condemned. Uh, this is part of why little children obey their parents. It is not simply out of love for their parents, but out of the reality that if they disobey, there will be time out, or they'll be grounded, or something else will happen. But as they grow and mature into adults, they learn to love their parents more perfectly, so that with or without a punishment, they will want to please their parents. So it's supposed to be with God. Perfect love, in fact, casts out fear, John says, so that we have not fear but confidence on the day of judgment. And this kind of love is possible, John reminds us in verse 19. This kind of love is possible because he loved us first. God loving us first is what makes this entire task of being made perfect in love possible. Think with me for a few moments about the way John has presented this entire truth. Think think with me about this as we begin to draw this to a close. God is love. God wants to shape us into people who love like him. And this is only possible because he loved us first. This is the way John has shaped this passage. I'd like to call us this morning, I'd like to call all of us this morning, to return to God's love. Now some of you may may be thinking, I've never left it. Uh, But even so, in kind of a counterintuitive way, we can still return to his love even when we've never left it. Uh, Because unless we've already been made perfect in love, and I doubt any of us want to make that claim this morning, unless we've been made perfect in love, we still have more growing to do 
in this area. And so if you're finding it hard to love your neighbor or love a stranger or love someone who inconveniences you or love even your loved ones in really hard and difficult times, we can be tempted sometimes to just take a deep breath and just make ourselves love them on our own strength, on our own steam, on our own moral fiber. But that's not what John says to do. Uh, the entire way he's presented this passage speaks against that. If you're finding it hard to love someone, John would have us return to God's love and abide in him. Because we can't abide in him without being shaped into people who love like he does. And in the same way, if you're finding fear and anxiety and uncertainty just overwhelming and hard to manage, we can be tempted to just take a deep breath and just get over it. But that's not what John says to do. It is only perfect love that casts out fear. And we are only made perfect in love by abiding in the God who is love. The great work of our lives as followers of Christ is to be made perfect in love. And that work is possible because God first loved us. Let's keep on intentionally abiding in that love, drawing nearer and nearer, because there's nothing more important we can do. This morning, if you need to make your first contact with the God who loves you in this way uh, and who loves you this much, we extend that invitation every Lord's Day uh, to come to him in faith and repentance and baptism. Uh, or this morning, if you have any other need, encourage you to stand uh, while Jason leads us in our song of invitation. All things are ready, come to the feast, come for the table now is spread, ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Feast all else 
surpassing wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers, do this in my memory. God so loved what wondrous measure surpassing wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers, do this in my memory. Feast divine, all else surpassing Precious blood for you and me. While we sup, Christ gently whispers, Do this in memory. Precious feast, all else surpassing wondrous love for Do this in my memory. We've come to that portion of our service where we cast our mind's eye back to the scene of the cross as we think about the sacrifice that God has made for us, that Christ has made for us as we gather around this communion. If you don't have a cup, uh, if you would raise your hand and we'll have, maybe Gunner can bring you one. But as we gather around this table to partake of these emblems, we do it sort of following uh, that which was uh, the apostles left for us or the disciples left for us in Acts 20 and verse 7. We know that they came together uh, upon the first day of the week uh, to break bread. And so that is what we do. Lee's lesson this morning, quite frankly, was a great warm-up for preparing ourselves, our hearts and our minds for this communion. To think about the love of Christ and how that was manifest on this earth. That he came down and gave his own, his, God gave his only son. Christ came down, took upon the form of man, and took our sins to the cross. But I want to focus on one thing, one word that, that and Lee touched on this, but it is Perfection this completeness, this idea of having God's love is complete in us. We complete that love if he abides in us. It's, it's a very circular relationship. It's a re reciprocating relationship. We think about we love, why? Because he first loved us. His love is perfected in us, and we are perfected by His love. It is the, the blood that was shed for us on that cross that we contact in baptism that makes us new, that washes away those sins, that make us perfect in His eyes. We will never be perfect until that day. 
really perfect. We know that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what Paul says in Romans. But Paul also says in the book of Colossians, he says that to put on love, because that is the bond of perfection. And so that is the bond that we have through Christ's love that we can have that hope of eternal life. That we can have that hope of being truly perfect one day when this life is over. I want you to think about that sacrifice that God made for us, that which he gave up. Christ was willing to carry our sins to the cross for each one of us. And it is that we abide in him, that we abide in his love, that his love is then made perfect. It is made perfect through us. Let us pray. Our most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we humbly approach your throne this morning. God, so thankful for the blessing that you have given us in your plan of salvation, that you were willing to send your only begotten Son down to this earth, that Jesus was willing to take up that cross, that he was willing to carry our sins to that cross with him. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity that we have to commune together, to commune with you in your presence this morning. Lord, we pray that you'd bless this bread, which represents Christ's body. It was broken for us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would Take it in a manner that is pleasing unto thee, and that we may show his death until he comes. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow again. Dear Heavenly Father, we once more uh, come before you, mindful Heavenly Father, of the sacrifice that was made for us and the opportunity that we have in it, that hope of eternal life, Heavenly Father, that we may be perfect, per perfect one day. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for that blood that cleanses us, Heavenly Father, that makes us new, that washes us clean, Heavenly Father, from the sin that we have in our lives. Lord, we pray that you'd bless this cup, this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood. We pray that we would uh, take it in a way that is pleasing unto thee, and that you would bless us, uh, Lord, as we do it. We ask this in Christ's precious name. Amen. We, um, we also take this opportunity uh, really just as a matter of convenience, sort of aside from the Lord's uh, Supper, uh, to take up a, an offering. And we know that uh, the Bible teaches us that God loves a cheerful giver. We know that it was a regular practice for the early church to, uh, to take up a collection for the needs of the saints. And uh, so we will do that at this time. Uh, but before we do, uh, I'll read from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul there writing to the church, he says, uh, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders uh, to the church churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collection when I come. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the blessings of this life that you have given us. We know, Heavenly Father, that all good and perfect gifts come from you. We know, Heavenly Father, that the things of this world are perishable. 
Lord, that they are corruptible and that these things will be done away with. But we are thankful that you uh, allow us uh, these things to, to enjoy uh, and to have uh, those necessities, uh, Lord, that, that, that we have here on this earth. Uh, we're thankful for, for, for so many blessings that you give us. Lord, we pray as we uh, make an offering this morning that we would, we would do it with a, with a good conscience and a, and a cheerful heart, Heavenly Father, uh, that your work may continue. We pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, you would bless it and bless us as we give. We pray for uh, discernment and, and wisdom, Heavenly Father, and as we, as we uh, decide how to use this money. We, we pray that you'd be with those who watch over it, who, who, uh, who are steward uh, this offering, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, uh, give them a, a clear heart and a clear mind as to how it would be used, and certainly, Heavenly Father, that it would be uh, for your benefit, uh, Lord, that it would be that, that, that your name is raised up, that you are glorified uh, in it. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would always be found uh, doing your will, Heavenly Father, that others may see your love uh, in the acts that, that we have uh, here on this earth. Lord, go with us in all that we do and continue to bless us. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping God with us today. I hope you all have a blessed uh, afternoon. As we wrap up, I'll just make a few announcements and then we'll be led in our closing song and dismissed uh, with a word of prayer that uh, I believe our brother Charles will be leading this morning. Um, one, uh, let me just say thank you to everyone who was able to help out with Trunk or Treat last night. It was a lot of fun. It was good to bless the children by uh, just being, being a, a good present for them, putting a smile on their face, giving them candy, and it was a good time of fellowship for all of us. So uh, thank you, everyone, who was part of that last night. Uh, let me announce that tonight we will have our Sunday evening Bible study uh, here at the church building. It's been a few weeks since we've done it the traditional way. We didn't have it last week with Song and Scripture Service. Two weeks ago, it was out at Kelsey and I's place. And so we'll be back at the church building tonight at 5 o'clock to talk some more about this really powerful, uh, moving passage of Scripture that uh, we really only kind of scratched the surface of this morning. So I encourage you to be there tonight to uh, read and discuss this uh, some more. Uh, then coming up on November 2nd, this coming Saturday, will be our fall fellowship at Jason and Amanda Salisbury's house. Um, they did ask me to just remind everyone the way that, that we uh, went about doing this last year was uh, there was uh, soups and chilies that people were welcome to bring, also finger foods, and that just kind of made up the meal for the evening. So I uh, encourage you to be thinking about perhaps what you'd, what you'd like to bring if you're able to bring something uh, for that, uh, that time of fellowship. If you're not able to bring something, please don't. Don't feel like that makes you unqualified to come. We would love for, uh, for the whole church family to be there for that great time of fellowship. And then uh, next Sunday, uh, November 3rd, I uh, want to just remind you all we'll be having a special collection uh, for disaster relief. We'll be sending these funds to the Churches of Christ Disaster Relief uh, out of Nashville. And so I encourage you to be thinking and praying about uh, your financial situation and what you may be willing, uh, what what. The Lord perhaps may be moving you to, to give. Remember that the Lord loves a cheerful giver, uh, but I want to encourage you to be thinking and praying about that so that uh, we can send some relief to, to those who are in need. Uh, also, this morning, right after worship, there will be a teacher's meeting uh, in the cry room, I believe it's where it's going to be held. Is that right, Bob? It'll be held in the cry room right after worship. And so if you're currently teaching, if you are interested in teaching, uh, if you think maybe one day you'd like to do that, I encourage you to be part of that uh, meeting uh, right after worship. Uh, are there any other announcements that I have overlooked that need to be made uh, before we dismiss this morning? Jason? Yeah, I, I was actually thinking about just going to throw a sign sheet somewhere out here in the body for, oh, okay. for next week. So if you want to, feel free to sign up, but there will be plenty of food. Again, as, as Lee mentioned, just, just finger foods, and everybody last year sort of just brought chilies and soups and crock pots, and it worked out well. So uh, feel free to sign up if you want to, or just show up. We don't care. <laughs> So, so if you didn't hear Jason, there should be a sign-up sheet in the back. Even if you miss it or forget to sign up, uh, feel free to just bring whatever, whatever you're able. Okay, I do have one other announcement, but what I need is in my Bible. So give me just a moment. Uh, 
uh, I was asked to read this this morning uh, to our wonderful church family. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your love and support over the years. Thank you for being such a great family. It has been an honor growing and worshiping with you in Christ. There are not enough words to express how much we love you. Thank you for all uh, the gifts, prayers, and help during this move. We will miss you so much forever, your family in Christ, uh, the Bridges family. Uh, they moved just this past Friday down to Georgia. Uh, they have made it safely there, and so uh, they just wanted to send that card along for us uh, to read. Uh, grateful for them, and uh, it's wonderful to see, um, see how much, not only we know how they've blessed us, but, but how we've blessed them as well. Well, uh, if there's nothing else, I want to say again, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. If you would be standing at this time, Jason will lead us in our closing song, and we'll have our closing prayer. <clears throat> sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Bow with me, please. Our Father and our God, this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Father, have mercy on our souls. If we'd all be honest, we sin each and every day of our lives. Whether it's driving too fast, whether it's just coasting through a four-way stop, or whether it could be cheating you. You give us 24 hours a day how much time do we spend with our TV? How much time are we on our computer? Versus how much time we spend reading your word. Father, we ask for your forgiveness. The only way we know who you are, the only way we know about your love for us and your care is through your word. And Father, we need to spend more time to be more godly. Also, Father, we know that churches are to evangelize. How can we grow? How can we grow the Lord's church without evangelism? It's a command. And, Father, we pray for those that are peacemakers. The world right now is in a mess. Everyone's wanting to get into a war. Why don't we just stop and say, hey, blessed be the peacemakers that they may go in and say, look, this is not the way to handle situations we don't try to kill one another we try to love one another we try to come and let, let's reason together and father we pray from the courthouse to the white house here in Nick, here in, in our united states we have an election coming up father help us to be able to elect one that's godly someone who would lead the country someone who will the nations will realize that we're not trying to kill anybody. We want peace in the world. And Father, we pray that you'll watch over him for the rest of this day and throughout the rest of the week. In his blessed name, amen.